Welcome. Thank you so much for taking your time on a chilly Thursday evening to be here. Um, my name is Cecilia Rubino. I'm the director of the Lang Theater Program, and it's really a privilege to have you here, and a great privilege to uh, be asked to introduce Dan Safer, um, whose, <laughs> whose work um, we will be engaging with for the next hour. Um, the wonderful Ash Tai, who helps organize these things, um, wants, wants me to remind you that there will be a Q&A after Dan presents his work. Um, Dan and I were just reminiscing um, that in fact we worked together at the same studio um, about a decade ago, and I have memories uh, of his rehearsals on the other side of the room with Ruben that were really loud. Um, but uh, Dan claims that he needs no introduction, but um, in deference to this artwork series, um, we have a tradition of doing that. So if you'll bear with me, um, I'm gonna read you something um, and uh, we'll see how it goes. So director choreographer Dan Safer is the artistic director of Witness Relocation. It's an award-winning dance theater company um, which was formed in 2000. The company is an ensemble, and it bases and makes its shows ranging from fully scripted plays to original and devised pieces of dance work, dance theater pieces, and um, many things that go in between. Um, based in New York City, they are recognized as one of the ensembles who now lead the city's progressive theater scene, according to the Village Voice. And they are the recipients of three New York Innovative Theater Awards. Uh, Witness Relocation combines dance and theater with the energy of a rock show, exploiting contemporary culture into intensely physical and outrageous and poetic performance. And they perform frequently in dance and theater venues, both nationally and internationally. Um, Dan Safer has recently choreographed and co-directed the acclaimed Ubu Sings Ubu, um, with Tony Torn and Julia Atlas Muntz. Uh, thank you, Muse, appreciate it. Besides witness, witness relocation shows, Dan's work as a choreographer has been seen at BAM, at DTW, St. Mark's Church, and Ashlawn Opera. He has choreographed plays, operas, rock videos, fashion shows, and films. In 2012, he choreographed Stravinsky's Rite of Spring for the Philadelphia Orchestra, with the Obie-winning New York-based Ridge Theater. Uh, in 2007 to 2009, he was the recipient of Six Points Fellowship, uh, it was a performance fellowship, which I'm hoping I got that right, and he won uh, two New York Innovative Theater Awards. Art Forum Magazine called him a pure expressionistic danger, and Time Out New York called him, in quotes, a purveyor of lo-fi mayhem. He's the head of movement training at NYU's Playwrights Horizon Theater School, which is where we shared our uh, co-taught uh, many years ago. And um, he is a frequent teacher at the Norwegian Theater Academy. Uh, and always to end up with really important facts, he used to be a go-go dancer, and he once choreographed the Queen of Thailand's birthday party. So without much ado, um, please join me in welcoming Dan Safer. That was about all I actually had to talk about, so we can just have the, the snacks. Um, how do you work this? Okay. Um, wait, let me put on the background music again. Yeah. Um, okay, so I have um, some videos, and I have uh, some things to talk about, but I hate these uh, like lecture-type things, so what's going to happen is uh, there's all the questions are in that paper bag, and we'll go around and people can pull a question out and read it, and then we're gonna roll dice, and the numbers one through six are each worth 30 seconds, and I'll answer the question for however long the dice say, and then at the and there's a timer, Ari has a timer, and then she has a bell, so th she'll ring the bell, and then I'll have to stop talking, and we'll move on to the next question or video, just so it remains interesting for me, and then hopefully for you, because if I'm bored, you're certainly gonna be bored. Um, but first, I thought we could show a video just to get things started. Um, I have to cut the music off, though. It's set. And then this one's not on my computer, so it has to go to the interweb. But that's OK. Here. <laughs> Thank you. 
So that one is, that show is uh, um, called Dancing for a Sabbat Experiment, was based on an article from Scientific American uh, by this guy John Calhoun about overpopulation in uh, rats and this thing called the behavioral sink, that when there's too many of them and resources get scarce, uh, how they just churn on each other and everything falls apart. And uh, also I had just gone through a really bad divorce, so they were kind of all about the same thing, so that duet is of a whole with that. Um, and then let's look at one more. Let's look at one that has lots of talking in it, because I also do plays. Um, and this one is from Five Days in March, which is by a Japanese playwright named Toshiki Okada, who's this amazing writer. Um, you all can come in and sit. You don't have to linger in the back. Uh, hi. Um, and the fun thing about Toshiki's stuff is it's just, it's super verbose. And every single thing you hear them say is written. He writes all the tangents and all the, like when you, um, okay, like if I was trying to, like all of that would have been written. All the, like if I was trying to, um, you kind of, uh, 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 um, ums are all on the page. So you have to sort of get all of those thoughts. But you can come in and sit. Don't be shy. Um, yeah. So uh, this is sort of the flip of, uh, of the Rat Experiment show. This was like heavy, heavy, heavy talking, but still has a, has a, a base in physicality and dance. And this one, the volume is sometimes a little wonky, so we may have to play with the volume over there. And he does quickly remember, and that's what uh, So from here, what ends up the story happening turns over to day one of the five days in March for Ozama! <laughs> you can go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> Who got separated from the Mino guy, but... Okay, from the night of day one to the morning of day two, Nothing like the hookup that Minobe had was happening for Asuka. He was just waiting for the first train. With no activity till morning. And was apparently just wandering around her pongi, kind of aimlessly. But actually, for Asuka, there was a possibility at the club where, like, Asuka that night was secretly, to be honest, Asuka thought there was a girl who was uh, maybe uncomfortable. Apparently there was maybe a chance that Asma could maybe hook up with the chick. But in the end, that film didn't show up. So after the concert, he was like, Oh, me no face taken off. And, Oh, the trains had stopped running. What the heck am I going to do by myself till morning? Asma thought. So then, back to where I thought we'd start. I might as well get out of here. This is where he left the club, but even as he left, there was this lingering thought in his mind, like, Oh, that girl person didn't show up, I guess, and the Rapungi night is really cool, and stuff like that was what was going through his mind, but Azuma hadn't told Minobe there's maybe this sort of girl who might come, or anything, but he talked to me about it a lot, and that's why I'm able to talk about it, because I listened to him, so now it's I had met with Azuma in the evening of the day after the concert. I had a little... <laughs> we met up because I needed to return money I had borrowed from Azuma. Oh. oh, so now we're going to do when I heard that story from Azuma. That's the thing we're going to do. Remember there was the 
concert about two days before the really, we just met at a movie theater. So it's like, yes, okay, we did chat a little bit for some reason, but already though, just from that little chat, it was really like, whoa. Like, truly, like, please, thanks, but no thanks. Or like, I don't know what to say, you know? So she was the kind of girl who's not at all your type. Also has the distinction, I think, of that was the first time anyone in New York ever paid Dave Malloy for a score. He's since moved on to bigger things. Um, yeah, but that was Dave's music, which was super fun. Um, okay, let's do a question, yeah? So who's got the bag? Well, uh, yes, anyone can, can choose a question, and then th maybe they, and then they can come to the microphone and read the, what? Yeah, bring, the, bring them the microphone. What have you learned about the human body from being a dancer slash working with dancers? Oh, okay, let's roll the die to see how long I talk. <laughs> That's a, a minute and 30 seconds. So let's read the question one more time. What have you learned about the human body from being a dancer slash working with dancers? Oh, one I would say don't land on your knees. That is the most important thing I have probably learned. Because I used to, when I was like in my 20s, I thought I was really tough and I uh, all punk rock and I landed on my knees a lot. And now I have bad knees. So don't land on your knees. Um, people that are capable of doing way more than they give themselves credit for or think that is possible. Um, like your limits are not really your limits. And I think that's a really important thing that I've learned about the human body is that... Um, so much of it is psychological that so much of it is like and uh i do a lot of yoga and now i can go from uh and i'm f i'm 45 so you don't think that you're gonna like get better at shit when you're 45 physically but now i can go from camel into wheel i can like throw back which i'd never been able to do in my whole life so it's all psychological like you just go mm, let me try it and it's resilient. Your body will bruise and you will get sore and that's how it's designed and that's not a bad thing. Uh, like when you build muscles, you're actually tearing muscles and they're re-knitting. There is, it's a, it's a flexible uh, machine. And it's also uh, eat well is really important and get enough sleep. Like this is it, this is your instrument for even if you're not a dancer or a performer. Like, 10 seconds, uh, yeah, uh, lots of, uh, a vegetable-based diet is, is re really helpful. And uh, I mean, don't eat meat just because animals are nice. That was a shitty ring. There you go, good, okay. Um, yeah, that's my answer to that question. Thank you, let's look, yes, yeah, go, <laughs> clap, thank you. And that's, should we, should we do another question? Okay, we'll do one more question and then we'll do maybe another video. Louder, faster, funnier. Oh, good, good. Yeah, how long? Is, how long? That's one minute. Each, each, each point is worth 30 seconds. Louder, faster, funnier is advice that uh, um, this directing teacher, this great director named Marcus Stern gave me years ago. I used to be his teaching assistant at NYU, and then he moved to ART. Um, louder, faster, funnier just means that is basically what you have to do as a director to a show to every moment. Um, funnier might mean more entertaining. Entertaining might mean more gripping, but I discovered, and when I was younger, I thought it's like louder, faster, yeah, but maybe like louder, faster, more intense, or louder, faster, angrier, but it's actually 
Louder, Faster, Funnier works. When I was working on these Chekhov plays uh, in upstate New York with this guy, Brian Murtis, who's a great director, th they were just super sad, heartbreaking plays, and he was always like, where are the gags? Where are the, where are the gags in here? How do we pull people in? How do, we, how do you get people? Because if people are laughing, they're disarmed, and then, you can, get, then you, can get, you can get to a deeper place. So it's like, Louder, Faster, Funnier means how do you hold their attention, how do you keep things going, and then how do you disarm them, and how do you bring... J You'll never know the next, the end of that thought. Right, let's do another video, and then we'll do more questions. This is from uh, this play, Eternity, which is, we, we did three plays that uh, Charles, Charles L. Me, that Chuck Me wrote for us, and this was the second one. Um, and this, I'm always interested in the line between dance and people dancing, and how do you make like a choreographed dance that has elements of improvisation, but has elements of party dancing, like just, because my favorite, uh, I hate leaning on that thing, uh, lean down. Uh, I was at a, I had a, sh I w we were in a dance festival in Poland and they did a, they asked all the choreographers who were there, what's your favorite kind of dancer to work with? Or what's your favorite kind of dancer? And people are like, oh, I like a Limon trained person. Or oh, I need someone with like this much ballet or blah, 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 whatever. Um, and I was like, my favorite dancer, like what kind of dancer I like the most? I was like, give me like, uh, like an out of shape businessman in his 50s in a bar and he's had too many drinks, and ABBA comes on, and it's his favorite song, and he's like, yes, I have to dance. To and that's my favorite dancer. Like, like, that's someone who is just joyfully thrilled to go for it. So that kind of dancing is, like, what makes me happiest to see. And I love beautiful, good technical dance, but, like, I really love seeing that person dance. So I'm always looking, how can you have elements of that inside of uh, inside of like the dance world or the dance that you know that dances. Uh, so this one does a little bit of that, taking like club dancing and party dancing and puts it inside that frame a little bit. Um, and there's also a little bit of talking and stuff. Even as a shift in the breeze transforms. Let's go from the same show. This is a little more. Uh, this is some little more like intense stuff. Uh, so we'll go more video. We'll turn the lights out. Starved four, stopping of the stomach twenty nine, swine pox four, teeth and worms seven hundred and sixty seven, thrush fifty seven, vomiting six, wolf eight, worms one hundred.
So that was, I'm also always interested in the same way I'm curious like what's what's behavioral, what's uh, and like what's choreographic. Like how do you generate choreography and make things that are equally in interaction, like you equally a scene. So it's like it's not just dancing around. It turns into these are people having a thing to transpire between them. Um, oh, these are some NYU students who made a thing. This is a thing. <laughs> this is I don't know oh, my teaching shit is still in here because um, I had to do this for a, a job interview. Um, but let's look at look they made this. It's like thirty seconds long. Don't worry about it. But it's good. It's with some of the same techniques that I use all the time. Um, and then, uh, why don't we do another question, and then we'll keep going with some videos, right? Go look, go they want to ask a question. <laughs> Make it good. It's all random. Um... How to not be boring? Oh my god! You said make it good. Yeah. Fuck you! I still got it. Oh fuck! Really? It's three minutes. <laughs> <laughs> All right. How to not be boring? I'm doing it. I'm doing it right now. Um, no. Uh, how to not be boring? Uh, it's actually a great question. Um, how do you keep engaging with people? How do you? I think in rehearsal. Uh, uh, the outside eye, like the director or choreographer, they're the stand-in for the audience. So if you're bored, as in that role, if you're bored, the audience is going to be bored. So that's the thing. It's like, and then um, uh, what is unignorable? What makes it so? Like, like I, I remember I was uh, talking to someone. They're like, well, you always get bored of your own work eventually. Like, or in rehearsal, you always get a little bored, and that's okay. It's like, no, that's not okay. That's the that's. I feel like boredom is actually the greatest tool. Um, uh, like an artist or whatever it is you call yourself can have whatever I call myself uh, because you're looking at a thing and you go when you're bored when your brain begins to go over there like when you not to Ari uh, just like over there in general uh, like when you're like oh I wish there was more coffee or what are we gonna have for dinner when the thing in front of you is not holding your attention those are the moments to work on that's the moment to dig into so it's actually informing you as you go your own your sense of boredom is is the tool that lets you go look at this, dig into this, uh, explore this moment. Um, and it to me, it's often in the detail. It's often in the precision and the, uh, the, the what is this-ness of it and how do you make things more themselves? How do you dial the volume, even if it's um, whatever it is, H how does it become more itself? How do you get yourself as a creator out of the way and help the thing become more it and how do you get it to tell you what to do how do you let the work she hated what i was saying it's like i'm out of here i'm out of here um yeah uh, i guess i was being boring um <laughs> but uh how do you intensify the feeling of the moment you're in so that uh in terms of like uh, like theatricality like i don't know i'm i'm just i'm jumping around but like I i'm so into uh, like glitter and like good songs and things that get people excited and like like surprises surprises are so vital like that's how to not be boring like like why would you not want something to be delightful or uh, amazing or um, su surprising or, or shocking or like oh why would you not want to have that moment of pulling somebody out of their um, normal experience and looking at something with a, like a fresh set of eyes. How do you make something, I mean that goes like to Brecht and shit, but like how do you make something that's normal turn into something that we can investigate and look at and go like, oh like normal, like well, what even is that? How do we how do we approach this in a way that you can view the everyday, what? You can view the everyday as, as an amazing event. Um, like that's how not to be boring. So how do you take, look around you and see what's going on and go like, I know, it was, was going to be the biggest pearl of wisdom of the night. Let's do one more question. Another one. Let me just skip this stuff. No, I want to skip that one. This one's fun, though. Do you feel?
feel you have to be socially responsible as an artist? Do I feel I have to be socially responsible as an artist? I feel like I have to be socially responsible as a person. I don't feel like there's a difference. Um, so yeah, yeah, yes, absolutely. Um, and then how that manifests. I don't like being beaten over the head with politics in a show because I feel like, uh, it's a, or I'm not good at it. Some people are really good at that kind of thing. I'm not, and I feel like it limits what things are about, but to approach things from the, I know the, like in that intro, I think, like I think you read the, an old mission statement that I had, and I think the new mission statement on, on my website, because I got sick of mission statements, said something about like we do all these things that are basically about the fact that you don't have to be a dick. And that's actually what the company mission statement is now. And I think that's so important. Um, like how, 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 how do you, I don't know, I, I, I think that there's so much work that goes on that's like, things are terrible, things are awful, and I agree, I don't need to be reminded of that. I feel like me as a person, as a socially responsible person, one thing I am a little bit good at is going, but maybe things could be better, maybe we could look at that, and it's not like things are fine, things are not fine, but we know things are not fine, but how do you break open the possibility, uh, how do you look at how things are not fine and then break open the possibility that things could be better, that like, like fuck, we could be like a little bit nicer to each other, and that's a huge, huge, huge thing, um, and to me that's, like that's social responsibility, and starting it on a really, really small level, and then also reaching for a giant level, but I don't know. I mean, I feel like, like if maybe if I was a better person, I would be a human shield somewhere. Uh, I, I think about that a lot, or I would have like I would like go join Doctors Without Borders and carry shit for people. Uh, um, hmm? Oh, am I doing? Oh, I thought you said ten seconds. Uh, I'm, uh, but I'm not doing that, and and sometimes that keeps me up at night. But also, I feel like if maybe I can make somebody think about things differently, it's hard. It's hard when you're when you're me. And your audience is people who agree with you. How do you make people think? Um, so yes, it's important, but I don't have the answer to it. That bell sucks. There we go. Okay, let's do another video because that was a little heavy. Um, this is from that same rat experiment show. Uh, the second half of that show was we did these elimination games, which were, I got obsessed with the downhill skiing in the Olympics for a while, and I loved it, because it was like you understand the course, and you know how it's gonna go, but the people watching it and the people doing it don't know how it's gonna play out. Uh, and I thought, that's like awesome theater. Uh, so the elimination games, the end of the show, and that, that piece was about, um, the overpopulation and how the populations would die out. And, like, they would like begin to kill each other. And they would just like lack of food. They would just, everything went to hell. Um, so the show ended with these uh, contests in, in a row. And the contests were drawn out of a hat, like we're doing with this stuff, uh, um, every night in a different order. And then people had to perform them in a different emotional state, right? And you'll see. And then there was a row of chairs. And whenever somebody lost a round, they were kicked out of the show. And they had to remove a chair. So it was like musical chairs format. And then the winner of each night actually got an extra $20. So there was actually like a reason to try and win. It wasn't just theatrical. It was like, and on like, you know, <laughs> like da downtown performance, that's like 20 bucks is pretty good. So they, they actually wanted it. Um, so this is just like three or four of the games that we, we did at the end of that show. Okay, what do we have next? Find a red ping pong ball out of a thousand in a state of searing agony. <laughs> I'm sorry, Tony Fine. Take a chair. Duck walk with a book on your head in a state of completely unwholesome lust. Yes! Oh. Unwholesome lust. Zero, zero, unwholesome lust. Un unwholesome lust. Yes, unwholesome lust. Spin around in a circle as fast as you can while staring straight at the ceiling. In a state of utter deep despair. Oh. Oh. Utter despair. 
despair as you spin around as fast as you can, staring at the ceiling. Stare at the ceiling, zero zero. Stare at the ceiling. Good. Mm. What is it? I'm sorry, zero zero. Mm. You just didn't make it to the chair on time. <laughs> That's pretty good, right? Um, also, I we t we did that show a ton and like we toured it places and I never won once. It was so. Uh, humiliating. It was like it was my show, and I never, I never won. Uh, okay, well look at this. This is um, this is uh, this is one of Dave's. Mo this is one of the Malloy shows that I directed and choreographed, and um, I got to do like giant theme park choreography, which was super super fun. Um, this is actually the one right before Great Comet. I should have been like, I should have been like, wait, let me do the next one, and then I would like be loaded. Um, all right, let's. Actually, that's not true. Sadly. Uh, one thing certain, I am Trudy. One thing certain, that I am as blue. Watch it black, watch it blue. Play it like you're supposed to. There's the second knowledge. Knowledge! Black Wizard, go! Take me to the edge of knowledge. I want <laughs> Question? It's another question. Choosing the dumb thing. That's why I cast you in the show, Dylan. Oh. Oh, oh snap! No, I'm kidding. 
How much time do we have? Two minutes. Choosing the dumb thing. Um, that's like uh, nothing is the, the 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 judgment call in rehearsal is the, is the wrong thing to do. Like the like the look like or the fear of like oh I can't do that that's too stupid. That's not the case ever. Um, or sometimes it is, but stopping your first impulse to be like like I want to mm, 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 always do it. Just get sometimes you need to get it out of your system and get to the tenth thing and that's the right thing or the hundredth thing or sometimes the thing that you feel like is too stupid is absolutely brilliant and sometimes you need high and low together so sometimes the really dumb thing is what lets you see the really elegant and beautiful things so it's like contrast becomes vital so choosing the choosing the dumb thing allows for tension and allows for space and and breadth of inside what you're what you're doing um and sometimes like like a Okay, like the dumb thing is a cheap gag, which again, like 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 my joke with you, like when you said that, um, is like it just gets things moving. Um, it, it it spikes your interest. You're like, what? Uh, and that is that's a fascinating place. Um, I love, like I love the audience reaction of like they are not doing that. Like that's one of my favorite reactions to have uh, for an audience is like you got to be fucking kidding me. Like that's a delightful place for to to be in. Like I love having that reaction. And I love like uh, giving that to people. It's so it's fun. Um, and some of like like I love like I love Jackass. That's one of my favorite shows ever. Uh, like the reason television was invented, Jackass, RuPaul's Drag Race. Um, and those it's like uh, or uh, like uh, I don't like you can look at like like high art like. Um, like you know what's dumb? Like most of Chris Burton stuff. Like I'm gonna like get shot on stage as a performance. That's dumb. It's fucking fascinating. I mean, I'm not gonna do that, but it's fascinating. Or like a lot, like a lot of Paul McCarthy stuff. Look him up if you don't know him. He's fucking amazing. Y you go like that's so. S <laughs> All right. Here's a music video that I made with this amazing composer named Skip Shirey, um, who does a lot of like contemporary and avant-garde circus music mostly. But then he also made this album, and we were. Um, I was he played me he played me the album like uh, like six months before it came out but in the not in the final mix and we were at a party and he put this song on and he was like and this is the this is like the song I'm not sure about and I was like you I have to make a video to that one all the other ones have like people singing in with them this one's just instrumental and it's my favorite one so uh, and then we made this video <laughs>
this is from the last show we just did, which was called The Loon, which was uh, based on a, um, a mutual of Omaha uh, educational record about loons, the birds, the loons. And then it was a collaboration with this uh, prof actor, writer, Robert M. Johansson, who uh, is a lead performer with Nature Theater of Oklahoma and a bunch of other folks. And he's amazing uh, and one of my best friends. And we, so we work together a lot. Um, and yeah, so it was originally, where we go? No, it's okay. You thought, I, I fooled you. I, I said, yeah. Um, it was originally just this loon record, and then we made it about, like, things that Rob and I, like, stay up late at night freaking out about. Um, uh, so that's what it's about also. Here we go. Now you can turn the lights out. <laughs> Okay. Here are the ten questions to the answers I gave you earlier. Okay. One, if you could choose the place, where would you like to die? Yeah. Two, where's your favorite place to have sex? Three, what three words describe your earliest dream? Four, have you lied in the past two days? Yes, of course. Yeah. Do you prefer cats or dogs? Five. Yeah. Six, what place are you most likely to avoid? Seven, which of us is most likely to see a ghost? Eight, what part of your body do you like the most? Nine, at what part of the day are you the happiest? Mm. Mm. Ten, what zodiac sign is not to be trusted? <laughs> now what? I'm sorry, did I, did I finish talking about the golden record earlier? I think I didn't, but that's okay. If you're interested, you can Google it when you get home. So let's look at reality instead. So, is this real? This conversation that we're having. But I guess you might say it's not really a conversation because you're just sitting there listening to me talk. But but isn't there something else going on here? Oh, maybe I'm not involving you enough. No, don't, don't worry, I'm not going to go into the audience and sit on your lap or anything like that. But I have to admit, the last thing that I was talking about, that whole loon myth, that was a lie. I made it up. Almost all of it. So can you trust what I'm saying now? Is this communication that we're having real? Am I myself here or am I playing some sort of character that I've made up for the purpose of this loon show in which the only thing I've said about loon so far is a total lie. But reality is entirely problematic. I mean, who's to say that the world outside this theater is, is any more real than this world inside? I mean, do you really know me? Some of you do. Some of you are people I know and, and love. So, some are acquaintances. Some, some of you are maybe friends on Facebook. And, and some of you see me on stage somewhere. You, you think you saw me in some show. And, and maybe I'll know some of you in the future. But, but you know, which of you really knows who I am? And is your reality of me different than my reality of myself? And which, which of those realities is more real? Am I more real here on stage or, or when you meet me after the show? Okay, I, I'm listening to an earpiece right now. It's feeding me all of my lines. But, but actually, I, I'm writing this right now and listening to the first prelude to the first book of The Well-Tempered Clavier by Bach on repeat in some coffee shop in Gowanus. And as I write this now, I know that it'll be less real than when I'm saying it to you guys right now. But I'm interested in being real with you now. No, I, I want to be real now, more, more than anything else. I'm tired of this, this 
art shit. I, I, I'm more interested in you and in, in interacting with you. In, uh, in being with you. I, I like it up here on stage. I, I always have. It, it's the reason why I'm up here. I'm a bit more shy when you see me out there. But maybe this is more real because I, I feel like I can just speak exactly what I'm thinking. I, I don't want to find something new right now. I don't want you to see anything in a new way. I, I just want to be here in this space. And, and I want you guys just to, to be here with me. And for us to enjoy this special, rare, weird experience of, of communicating in this odd way. I mean, it's like we're at the bar together, but we're here. And, and there's people dancing around me, and, 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 and you feel like you can't talk. But believe me, you can talk if you want to. I don't mind. You're not going to ruin the show. You did back there. I mean, I have this earpiece on, so I'll only be able to respond with whatever words I've written next. But that's OK. We can make do with that obstruction. I mean, it's part of our new reality. It's nice and cozy, right? We can just be here with each other. And, and later, I'm going to start talking about loons, but really, I'm going to be talking about something else entirely. I have to talk about loons because the show is called The Loon. Do you follow? OK, that's good. But if, if you haven't and you stop following me and you're watching these guys, that's great. This table dance is pretty awesome. And, and all of this somehow works together because we, we just put it together. Right, Dan? Yeah. Yeah. OK. Look, I'm just going to move my mouth for a bit. And you can imagine what I'm saying. Okay, you get to choose the content now. And I will say your content to you. Is that a really long one? Uh-oh. I hope it's only a 30-second answer. I think one of the most important things for new makers is to know, I don't know what the fuck I'm doing, which is the first place where all good ideas come from. That is the bravery of being an artist. I don't know if there is a question or topic in there, but I think you embrace that bravery. That was well, thank you very much. I came up much. with that on the spot. That was beautiful. That was very good, Riley. Thank you. How long do we answer it for? A minute and a half. That's good. That's good. I think that's so true. I think the, I don't know, I, I choose projects only if I don't know how to do them. If I know how it's going to play out, if I know exactly how to do it, then I feel like there's no point. Um, because then you don't learn anything, and then you don't push yourself, and then you don't then you don't figure out anything new. So the the I don't know what the fuck I'm doing is like it's not just part of it. It's like to me that's the that's the starting point. That's the cornerstone. Um, that's how to not get bored. That's how to continue um, pushing yourself and challenging yourself, and thus like keeping things exciting and not getting stuck in a rut, uh, which is hard. If you like if you keep making stuff. You get stuck in ruts. It's like, how do I get 
out of that. I mean, I've done shit like I felt like I was getting comfortable with what I was doing, and then I, m I moved to Bangkok for three years, so I would not be able to do any of my tricks or like make things that involve the English language like and communicate to people who didn't have the same shorthand as me. So it's like, how do you really like throw a wrench into the gears and and mess up your comfortable process um, to get to the place of I don't know what the fuck I'm doing so that you can then like surprise yourself and surprise the people you're working with. Uh, I had a rule for a while that I couldn't have chairs and I couldn't have chairs in my shows because I was doing so much chair choreography. So I just like took it away because I was like, oh, it's a crutch. You know, it's a crutch. I don't want that anymore. I want to not have the. Catering truck was what I was going to say. No, I was going to say. Uh, here's this one last dance from uh, that Chuck Me show. And this is fun because it was his stage direction was just there's a beach party. There's a beach party from an Italian movie. Um, and so I enlisted, uh, you'll see, I enlisted, this one has like maybe 15 people, but it was anywhere between like 15 and 40 um, of my students over at the NYU came out for the only for the last scene of the show. So you hadn't seen any of them beforehand. And suddenly they just mobbed the stage and we did this dance, which is really fun. Sam Pinkleton, we did that on our, we made that on our lunch breaks. Uh, Sam came in, because he, he used to be in the company. Uh, so he was like, I'll do that, it'll be fun. Um, yeah, and I think, yeah, thank you. So that's all I have for the, the video portion. <laughs> if there's any questions from the floor, we can do that. Or if there aren't, there's like pineapple over there. It's up to you all. Yes, yes, sir. Bring, bring Neil the mic. He's like a department head. Bring him a mic. Dan, thank you so much for presenting all of this. Thank you. You presented a lot of different kinds of work. But this is a question that I ask 
often at these artwork events where the art artists often come and they talk about, they tell us what they do and how they do it. And now I'm wondering why. Mm. And it might be different answers for different kinds of work, I don't know, but, but some of like the why, why do you make it, why do you present it? Uh, it's, no, it's, I, th I think it all comes from the same place. Um, I'm trying to figure out um, like how to be a how to be a person on the planet, um, and I think all of us have a lot of shit to work out, um, and it's really hard. And this is the best way I have figured out to get. If you can look at what you're dealing with outside of you, you can deal with it more. Um, I'm not on a timer. Uh, um, no, there's there's a there's a really good answer to this. Um, if uh, sorry, it's it's a uh, it's a tough one. Um, I don't trust reality at all. Um, like, watch this is this is it, it sounds funny, but it's not. Um, if I can do this, that should be technically impossible because my hand starts here, and then it has to go halfway, and then it has to go halfway, and then it has to. So there should always be another halfway, right? And yet I can do that, which means that our concept and our understanding of the physical world is inherently flawed and this is wrong this is not what's really going on so i want to know what's really going on um, but then i also know that this is what we have to deal with like i can't not pay my con ed bill because like but look my hand can touch a table like you know so 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 but no but that's really true um so you have to deal with this this is what we have to deal with so Feedback. So I want to try and deal with it as as best I can, and then um, and it also goes back to the you you don't have to be a dick thing, um, and I think this is a lot of it is me trying to figure that out and figure out how not to be an asshole um, and how to be better. Uh, and it sounds like it sounds really out. That sounds so altruistic, but it's really selfish. It's like I want to I want to figure this stuff out for me, and then uh, and then I find people who want to figure the same things out, and we make stuff together. And then hopefully, maybe that either inspires other people to think about that stuff or to help them figure it out also. Um, and it's like I'm, you know, it's. It, it it keeps people and it, when you're being honest like that, it also keeps people at a distance because it's a show, and uh, if it's not evident, like this is all armor, all the tattoos, all the jokes, all the funny shit, all like the uh, the cool guy with the boots and stuff. It's all armor, um, and it's hard to talk to people. Uh, it's easier for me to talk to people that way. So that's my answer, and it's all this. F all the shows, it's the same reason. It's much easier for me to talk to people that way than it is like, because I get upset and shit. So yeah. Yeah. Are there a lot of uh, talented young artists in the room? And I wonder if these you have beautifully produced work with talented people in it, and. Um, it looks so easy to get there. So, do you have anything to share in terms of how you get into a position where you can where you can work those things out in public with uh, with other people who want to work them out with you? Tenacity, that's it. Just don't just keep doing it, uh, and um, don't worry about where you're doing it. I think is a big one. I stopped making work for a while because I was like, I was like, well, I should have a show at BAM. Um, uh, and then, like the show I ended up having at BAM was one of my worst shows. Uh, um, and, but that, and that was so much later. So that was like like two decades after I felt like that. Um, uh, just you have to keep making stuff, and you just make it where at you do you just do it like you do it in the fucking garage, or you like you know I, I the the first half of my career was m a lot of it was like on the stage of the Pyramid Club or in the back room of a bar. And that's where you learn how to be interesting. And that's where you learn how, because if, if you're not interested, the audience will talk and leave. Um, that was vital, but that was also, you know, a, a budget of $10 and shit you found on the street and in the garbage and you just did it. Um, 
and you just keep doing it and you don't stop and when it gets it's like yes it's really hard to make stuff yes it 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 depletes you uh yes you're doing it in this country where there's no funding we know that going in so you just have to keep sticking to it or like maybe move to Europe and hope you get funding there but it's it's I've my friends there like it's fucking sucks and it's hard like we used to tour in France all the time and their funding's dried up not completely but you know it's like it, you, it can't be about like cha-ching at all you have to do it because you because you need to do it and you just have to not stop and if people tell you like this is pointless then go like well fuck off it's not pointless you just it's tenacity is the is that's the main rule yeah I like when people snap. That makes me feel like really cool. <laughs> Are you happy? <laughs> really? That's your question? <laughs> um, right now, uh, my life is a combination of really good and like burning garbage pile, to be honest. Uh, so sometimes, uh, sometimes I'm completely miserable. Uh, it's a, it's a, it's, it's, and it's funny, those two things like, like love holding hands. I don't fucking know why. Um, so yeah, I have moments of happy, like, like actually I love doing our show. That's so fun. Like our rehearsals are so fucking fun. And then, um, I'm up for this awesome job and if I get it, I'll be so psyched. And if I don't get it, then life continues as normal. Um, but then other parts of my life are like, like a, like the, the plane is a out to crash uh, and that sucks and it's really hard so I'm happy sometimes but uh, my uh, um, I have my friend Dana uh, Dana Dana Trixie Flynn who is the founder of this of this yoga studio on 19th Street and she's amazing um, I was taking her class the other day and she always is talking the whole time and she's great and she was like I used to I used to think that you had to stop suffering in order to become happy and then she said I'll never be happy if I wait for the suffering to stop. Uh she's like you just be, you can just be happy. You can be happy while you're suffering. That's completely part of the deal. Uh and I agree with her and that's super smart. So sure, yeah, I'm happy. And that's but that doesn't cap but that's not all of it. That's not 100% of the time. But yeah. Yes. If you could redo one of the pieces that you've done before, how would you do it differently? You mean like remount now or go back in time and fix? Um, I don't know. They all exist. They're like, it's like I, know, it's like I don't want to cover up any of my tattoos because they're a roadmap. Uh, and they all exist not perfectly, but they all exist as they were supposed to be at the time. Um, if I was to redo one now, uh, I would like change that one lift that I did with Heather because I fucked my shoulder up. Like I don't know, but like, like but like that, like honestly, like that kind of thing. Like I wouldn't, I wouldn't be, I wouldn't abuse my knees as much. You know, I would take better care of my body and not think I was like punk rock invincible. Um, yeah, I think it would be more about self-care and, and making sure the people and, 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 uh, not like choreographing moves that led to injuries I, is the really simple answer. I would rather like the people who I've worked with for years not have had like, like, t you know, a messed up leg or something. Yeah. I have a question from someone I don't know. Anybody? Who are you? Hi. Um, you said something about louder, faster, funnier. And I was wondering if you, like, does that mean that you don't believe that something exists in silence and beats and pauses? Uh, absolutely not. I, I, totally, I totally think stuff exists like that. Um, and that goes back to the contrast thing about how maybe the way to make something louder and faster and funnier is to have it, Bye, thank you for asking a question, uh, is to have it surrounded by like total stillness and, and silence and something really placid. So, so no, I don't believe that. 
but it's, it's all, and you know, and no, none of these rules work all the time. That's another really important thing. No, no rules are rules. Nothing, nothing makes sense all the time. Uh, you can always break them, and that's usually the, the better thing to do, but it's nice to have a thing to bounce off of. Yeah. Do do one more, or are we done? What do you think? Anybody? Um, what's the most interesting way to tell a story? For me, um, have Tilda Swinton tell it to me. That'd be great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's your answer. I don't know. It depends on the story. Like, like, okay, because form has to equal content. So, what's the content? And then, and then, how do you do it? If you're like, like the show we're doing is about a is about a party, so we're trying to turn it into throwing a party. Uh, so that's a, to me that's the most interesting way, but. It's really about what is the what is the story you're telling and how does that so there's not one way to tell a story and there's and every story wants its own uh, is its own unique challenge so how do you honor that and how do you have it tell you what to do and that's the most interesting way is to ask the thing you're talking about to talk back to you preferably with Tilda <laughs> yeah yeah what and glitter Tilda and glinter and glinter. Tilda and Glinter, Tilda and Glinter, uh, and Tom Hardy. Yeah, yeah, that would all work. <laughs> That'd be fascinating. Yeah, uh, he could like throw the glitter. Yeah, he was like, um, is that it? Was that is that the, the place where we end? Oh, you have one. You have, oh, there's one more question. No, ask it. No, no, I, I'll come up with something equally clever for the end. I'm not so so sure about your background. It sounds like you. Um, it's a white screen, some circles and theater. <laughs> yeah. um, as a as an artist, did you start with theater? And if so, question B is: At what point did movement make its way in? Or maybe if you started with movement, and what was the progression of that? I started like I started with theater like in like like middle school you know that was like where I started and then um and then my and then the dance came in very quickly uh um I started not liking when people were talking and being more interested in what their bodies were doing um and but then my intro to dance was I was going to punk shows and I was slam dancing uh and that was where my dance background started uh and then I was I was actually a go-go dancer for years and I was club dancing a lot um, and then I was doing lots of contact improvisation, uh, and that's like what I, that's like the dance form. I, if, if you don't count slam dancing, which I do count as a form, that's the form I've been doing the longest, uh, is like mosh pits and contact improv, which are so related, it's not even funny. Um, like it's the same skill set, basically. Just contact usually has less, like, nosebleeds. Um, usually. usually. Uh, so they, they, the two have gone hand in hand for me the whole time, and I've bounced back and forth. Like, um, like dance people often think I'm a theater person, and theater people often think I'm a dance person. Um, I remember I was, I say it casually, like I was once, t I was talking to William Forsyth once, which is like sounds like, oh yeah, we hang out. We don't at all. I was like talking to him for two seconds. Um, and he was like, I just say I do shows. I just do shows. And whatever they have in them is what they have in them. Uh, my vocabulary happens to have a ton of dance and a ton of theater in it, but it's whatever that moment wants to be is what it is. And if it's if it's all dance or all just someone standing still and talking, great. Or whatever the combo is, they I've never been able to separate them, so they just come out like that. Does that make does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah, and then Tom Hardy throws glitter. Yeah, all right, are we, are we good? Thank you. What? Thank you so much um, for coming. And um, just last note, you guys. Um, Dan's show with your Lang colleagues uh, is uh, April 12th through 15th at La Mama. Um, it's a Breck piece called Respectable Wedding rather than reluctant wedding, which was stuck in my head. Um, but but um, um, thank you so much for being here tonight, and uh, just give them a big round of applause, okay? Yeah.